And in part time, we started building this new venture. When we thought about you know, what discipline we wanted to start with first, obviously you start with the most difficult when you have the most energy. Talent or recruitment is, in my opinion, the most important problem to be solved today. And I know many people have tried and continue to try. I know it's a huge space, but I, I went into it naively, knowing that that would be my competitive advantage. And the reason I'm saying that is throughout my career, the single thing kind of weave into all the successful organizations that I've seen was an organization's ability to attract, develop, and retain talent. If you can do that, the idea is secondary. Welcome to Conversations with Lulu. Before I start, I want to say thank you so much to everyone who's tuned into my podcast for the past three years. You really keep me going. I have a favor to ask you though, if you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us in getting the show discovered. As for today's episode, have you ever thought about a recruitment process that you've been through, whether as a candidate or as a hiring manager and thought, wow, this was an amazing process? Probably not. Everybody struggles. I really believe that the recruitment system is broken. I tried to solve for it a long time ago. And so has my guest, Chris Saeed. He is the founder of No Bueno, a platform that is trying to solve for the recruitment challenge. It is a big task and no one claims to have the answers. So tune into this great conversation and see what Chris has to say. Hey. Hey, are we recording? <laughs> oh, okay. We are. <laughs> How are you? Very good. Yeah. Good to finally meet yeah, you in person. Yeah, likewise. I feel like we've been in each other's orbits for so long, we but never been. really connected. That's thank you true. for having me. Well, thank you for coming. I'm really looking forward to this. Likewise, likewise. What's been, uh, what's been happening? What's been on your mind lately? Oh, a lot. I think, you know, if you're in Dubai, you're probably feeling it for the last two, three weeks. Everything is crazy. Everything's 100 miles an hour for everybody. Uh, but for me, you know, as you know, we have Duck Life. Um, Duck Life is, is an agency. It's a marketing and, and branding agency, and we've never been busier. So, alhamdulillah, it's, it's great, but it's totally crazy. No Bueno, our you know, talent matching platform is live. We're in beta, but it's also scaling like crazy. So that in itself is absolutely, uh, I guess, overwhelming. Um, but yeah, super busy. Um, and then personal life, things just keep happening. Family keeps growing. More and more excitement in our lives. What's happening on the personal life? Having another girl. Wow. In December. Congratulations. Yeah. I'm known as Abu Sharlat. Now I don't know if I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to have a, a favorite. Okay. But yeah. So uh, everything's great. And how are you juggling all that? Because I'm we're not. always, <laughs> you know <laughs> what? Actually, I'm so happy you said that because we always <laughs> ask this this question to, uh, to women, right? Oh, yeah. how are you juggling kids and job? Because, you know, it's such... A norm that it's a like, woman topic. For yeah, some yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I'm happy that you said that yeah. you're having a baby, so that I can ask you, like, how? I do mean, you... it's really important to me in my list of things I want to accomplish. It's being a good father, whatever that means. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult, right? I, what does it mean to you to be a good father? Have you thought about it? I don't know. It's I I think parenthood evolves and changes with your children. Like you might have a definition today of what it means to be a good father to that child, but their needs change. Right. And mm -hmm. so I think being a good father means adapting. Uh, being a good parent means adapting, listening, understanding, growing with your children. Um, and, you know, being a parent five years ago is very different to today. And being a parent 10 years ago, or our parents is very, very different. And so for me, I think I think being a good father is just evolving and growing and listening to your kids, um, not trying to project or make them do the things you wish you did. Um, so yeah, it's a learning. I don't think parenthood is any specific thing. I think it's it's growth, it's listening, it's evolving. Um, okay, let's talk a little about about you. Sure. I mean, just to give our audience a, a glimpse of like who you are and what sure. you've done. Uh, you've done quite a few things in your life, but yeah. one of them, I think, which is interesting to me because I know uh, the company and I know the founder sure. uh, is uh, is your work at Kareem. Sure. And on your website, I had uh, I saw a quote from Mudassir Sheikha, who's sure. the CEO and co-founder of Kareem. I'm going to read it. He said, Chris played an instrumental role at Kareem, launching and growing markets, catapulting our brand in the early days and helping instill a culture that is still with us today. Yeah. So tell me about <laughs> those days. Like, what you know, what were some of the yeah. highlights? I mean... Um, Kareem just turned 10. Yes. Uh, so it's quite a milestone. Um, so Kareem is, is 
probably one of the most beautiful career moments of my life in terms of what it did for me. Um, and uh, I remember the first time we spoke, you know, one of their first hesitations, which I heard through back channels about me, was, man, he's pure rocket Chris. He's too aggressive. He's too cutthroat. He's, I don't know if he's going to match our culture, etc. And they were really worried about would I be a positive influence culturally or not um, because I was just really go, go, go. I came from Rocket where you ask for forgiveness, you know, um, you break all the rules. And, you know, eventually things worked out and I joined them. And my first role was uh, head of new markets, so to launch new markets. And my first mandate was to help uh, in collaboration with Abdul Elias to scale uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, they were struggling, so figuring out how to crack supply, how to crack demand, etc. And um, you know, history k- kind of you know speaks for itself. But we 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 exploded in Saudi. It worked really well. I grew up in Saudi, so for me, Saudi is the closest thing I have to home. And so, leveraging that as well as Abdullah and his connections and his know-how of the market, we quickly helped you know scale the company in Saudi, which was critical to the business. And I quickly started jumping on a plane and going country to country to country, opening new markets. And back then, we would hack everything. We'd get into a market with 15 phones, find guys with cars, no regulation, no no registration, nothing, and give guarantees for people to just accept rides immediately. We were hacking it. Um, and at that time, I was learning how to build operations for a business overnight. Um, and so... <clears throat> I was known as the Chris effect, essentially, uh, in the beginning. And we were growing market after market after market. The Chris mar- effect. Yeah. So yeah. you would send Chris to a market and, and it would just, it would, it would work. And, 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 and what was amazing was I was never in a company like Kareem in the sense that Kareem, what worked, and when people ask me, why was Kareem successful? And I think if I were able to dilute it into one statement, it would be that we were all, um, we all subscribed to this mission in a way that nobody had ever done before. Like it was almost, I would say like a, like a dream team. And we were so focused on winning that championship. There was nothing that we wouldn't do personally, professionally. We were so aligned. The, you know, we, we would bleed green. We would do whatever it took for that company. All of us. It wasn't a few players. How you know? many were you at the time? I think when I joined, we were, I think, around the 20 25 people um, okay. and then when I left I mean even when I left when we got to a scale of around 3,000 people it was the same so Kareem's ability to succeed rested in its ability to scale its culture everybody in the organization was going in one direction no matter what and I've never seen that again I didn't see it in other you know c- companies that I was a part of it was a full alignment across the organization mm-hmm. couple that with a work ethic that I've never seen And that was led by, I would say, Mudassa and Magnus. Their commitment, their dedication, their effort, their passion, it just it would just trickle down to the whole organization. Um, so they were the best role models. They, they walked the talk. It was amazing. They walked the talk. They, they, were, they were fun. They were charismatic. They had the right value system. But they were also super disciplined, um, which is rare to find that kind of a mix in an organization. I mean, many companies that are doing extremely well, you'll see that, but you'll see it in pockets, in clusters. You won't see it across the company. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so then I went from being a market launcher to um, one day Mudassar asking me, hey man, you're really creative. You're coming up with all these crazy campaigns. Um, could you take over marketing? Um, and, and by the way, we're, we're rebranding. So could you take over the rebrand and could you, you know, catapult us? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, then I took over marketing. Um, I had never done a marketing role in my life before, but I was in charge of this big group uh, of marketing. Um, so built the marketing engine, built the brand, rebranded. Um, I remember the campaign. Yeah. Better, it, better than, right? It was better than ever, better than Uber. Um, and then we had the slingshot campaign as well. Okay. And so he, he really loved our approach, my approach to it. I was a bit maybe too bold, um, but he loved that. Uh, it came with lots of risks um, and lots of mistakes, but huge opportunities. And Mudasser, I think one thing the leadership of Karim did at the time is when they would identify people who really wanted to succeed and knew how and were great at execution, 
they typically would move out of the way, right? And that's, you know, quite, you know, courageous, I think, nowadays. Absolutely. <laughs> takes a lot of confidence uh, in your people. And yeah. And it's just, I mean, if we take the, you know, if we take the Slingshot campaign, I remember I only showed it to them, uh, I think it was like a, two days before we released it, because I knew if I gave them the concept, gave them the idea, they would never say yes. What was it? I don't remember. The, the we slingshotted a person off okay. of one building in Marina, and he missed the landing about a thousand meters further. But oh, it was yeah. all CGI. Never really happened. Okay. But I knew as a concept, they wouldn't... I mean, it's it's very nerve-wracking to ask somebody, hey, I'm going to slingshot somebody. It's going to look like they missed the landing. Like they potentially <laughs> didn't make it. And I didn't think... I mean, and at the time was, how do we you know, launch our new brand completely differently and how do we get attention? Because we have no money. If how I, do we do it? If I may, like, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this and I, and I think it's important to highlight something um, because like, I come from startups as well for the past decade right and i think this is something that you would never see in companies you know someone who's creative and they would give them the leadership of like marketing uh, for this up and coming brand and it's yeah. it's you know and and this is i think we're going to get to the recruitment part that i think you yeah. know is very broken but this will never happen never. Uh, in the corporate world like, never It, you know, you would have had to have probably 20 years of marketing experience for you to be considered for that role. Absolutely. And you took it on board, you hacked it, you did it, you succeeded at it. Uh, uh, I mean, and, and I think kudos to a leadership that can recognize that. Yeah. I think if you can create a culture of problem solvers and then creative problem solvers, yeah. they can do anything you want them to do. At the end of the day, an organization needs to be able to execute, right? And once you once you build an organization and a culture of doers, you yeah. have to take a gamble and give them a chance to try to solve other problems. And I think that's what Modesto saw too. They saw a guy who, hey, he can launch markets. Hey, he's great at operations. Hey, marketing's broken. Can somebody go in and fix it? Yeah. Doesn't matter if he's creative and if he has the capability to kind of come to terms with the problem yeah. and he's able to execute, just give him a chance. And Even if you that. make mistakes, right? I made tons of mistakes. Yeah. I mean, I made tons of mistakes. Look, even even experienced marketers don't really get it sometimes. So it's not like no one's perfect. No, no, I made terrible mistakes. Yeah. Like, like hands down. Like I mean, I mean, I'm. It's actually funny. <laughs> we, we have the 10 year reunion on Thursday for Karim, and and I can't wait to talk to Mudesser about all the mistakes I made and laugh about them now. <laughs> you know, but but yeah, we made tons of mistakes. But we had an organization that allowed that to happen. Okay. You know what I mean? And I think. And the good obviously out, outweighed the, the Of course, the I mean, or else I wouldn't have, <laughs> I wouldn't have had a positive story. But, uh, but yeah, so Karim was fantastic for me, right? Um, and then in terms of learning, yeah. you know, so I learned, you know, I, I learned about discipline. I learned about organization. I learned about execution. I learned the power of values and, and, and building a culture. And, and to go back to, to, to Modesto's quote, I was initially, the biggest fear that they had with me is that I would not be a culture fit. And when I left, the, it was the complete opposite, that I was setting the culture for the organization. I was very public facing. I was very hands-on internally. I was very vocal. And I continue to be. That's my character, my personality. So kudos to my parents. But they, they gave me that space to speak. And they took feedback. You know what I mean? And they allowed you know, my voice to be something that resonated with the With the, with the whole organization and the community that we were building. And so when I left, I remember my last day there, they're like, you know. Why did you leave? Was it was it burnout? Was it? The, the, it's very simple. I think. I've spoken to a few people that worked at yeah, Karim. Yeah, I've, I've never. Said, like, no one's ever asked me. No one's ever asked me. So uh, I'll just be very honest about it. Um, there comes a time in an organization when you realize that the organization doesn't value you the same way and you don't value the organization the same way. And that's not a negative thing, is that your time has come. Yeah. And I had bigger ambitions for my future than to just be associated to Karim. I love Karim. I love what we did at Karim. It's a fantastic brand, but I'm not going to be defined by it. I'm only getting started career-wise. And if the organization doesn't value me or doesn't need me the same way it needed in the past, then my career is going to kind of stagnate a little bit. My, my impact in the organization is not going to be there. And my value and my motivation and mo my momentum will slow down. So I started to see that. We got to a stage where, okay, like what next? Like I, don't, I can't take this further. I don't have the know-how. Mm. I'm not a manager. I'm a builder. 
um, you know, I, I, I can't take it further than this. I can't continue being crazy, crazy, crazy. We need, they need a more mature mm -hmm. marketing leader. Also, the 20, 20 year experience marketing guy comes in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I have my own perspective on that too. Yeah. And I, I have my own perspective on what happened after me and, and they tried that and it didn't work. But, but I knew that for me, my career for Chris Aid as a person, Chris as a, for my career, it wasn't going to serve me. Okay. But it paid off, right? You Super were, bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now you can live, live yeah. comfortably, yeah. <laughs> live comfortably for a while, and uh, and start your own business, which yeah. which you've done. Yeah. Okay. So so from from your from Duck Life, which is a, an agency that helps brands, yeah, build brands, yeah, <laughs> or helps helps companies build their brand. You decided to launch more ventures, right? And yes. No Bueno, which is an equally cool, cool name, yeah. uh, was born. And yeah. and it's such a, I mean, recruitment is so complex. I think it's beyond uh, platforms, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's also cultural. It's also it ha it, ha it has a lot of um, complexity, and I think it's it's a very difficult space to solve for. It's super difficult. Um, so what are you doing? <laughs> okay, essentially. The ambition was always to get to a point where the agency would help us self-finance a new venture. Okay. And so the idea was build an engine that serves others to eventually serve your own and eventually transition to only your own brands, right? And so in the meantime, <clears throat> you know, we had product development, design, everything come in-house. We were able to hire all these people. Okay. And in part time, we started building this new venture. Now, when we thought about what venture or what industry or what discipline we wanted to start with first, obviously you start with the most difficult when you have the most energy. Um, and so talent or recruitment is, in my opinion, the most important problem to be solved today. Um, and I know many people have tried and continue to try. I know it's a huge space. But I, I went into it naively, knowing that that would be my competitive advantage, that mm -hmm. I was naive enough to try. And the reason I'm saying that is, throughout my career, the single thing that I can kind of weave into all the successful organizations that I've seen was an organization's ability to attract, develop, and retain talent. If you can do that, the idea is secondary. But I said, this is the biggest burning problem, and there isn't one breakout solution at the moment anywhere globally. So let's go into it naively. And from my experience, when I don't know how to do something, it's typically the best place to start because I'm not looking at the problem the same way as anybody else is because I have no experience. I would like to repeat that, by the way, to everyone who's listening. <laughs> Can you repeat that? Because I think it's so important. Yeah, because... If you don't know what you're doing, it's probably the best place to start. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I really <laughs> because believe you, that. You have a student mindset, right? You, you, you're, you're learning. Yeah, and, and you're not taking anything for granted you're not accepting everything or the status quo as the answer. And so you're actually innovating. And so when we, so we took our time and first tried to, tried to really understand what is recruitment today. So mm. we worked with a lot of recruiters that I had worked with in my past, whether external or internal, um, really specialists. And we spoke to them for a little bit. And we started to realize that most of the people that are tackling the problem are simply digitizing. To put it simply, mm -hmm. they're not really innovating. They're it's not online, changing. It's an online TV. Yeah, they're yeah. just trying to oh, make it a video or, or make it this or make it. But there was no real rethinking of the process. Yeah. And so when we when we spoke to recruiters and, and talent acquisition like teams, et cetera, we wanted to understand, okay, what's the flow? Like, how do you guys recruit, right? And I'll really simplify it. Uh, but But basically, we found out that the process is the problem. And what I mean by that is, you know, I had my aha moment to deciding to launch No Bueno was when I, I keep getting a WhatsApp message from people in my network. Hey, Chris, I'm looking for a CMO. Do you know someone? Hey, Chris, I'm looking for a marketing director. Hey, Chris, I'm the go-to guys for, for marketing resources based on my background and my agency. And one day I got a, I got a, a, a job description. I'm not going to say from who, but he'll know who it is. I got, a, I got a job description. The guy said, hey, I'm looking for a CMO. Here's a job description. Could you take a look? Amazing company, global brand, super. I look at the job description. I said, hey, man, by any chance, would you hire me? He said, yeah, man, in a heartbeat. You're Chris, dude. You're the king of marketing. Of course, tomorrow. I'm yeah. like, just 
so we're clear, I don't have the majority of the requirements that are in this job description. He goes, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'm like, that's the problem. It's not fine. Mm. That's where the process begins to be broken. And so when we mapped out the journey, we realized, you know, since Leonardo da Vinci, who put together the first CV, by the way, um, you know, nothing has changed fundamentally. And job descriptions are huge misrepresentations of opportunities based on preconceived ideas of everything and nothing. And CVs are exactly the same. They're over-embellished representations of people. They're not even over-embellished, by the way. They're, I mean, they're, they're of, right? Or like, they're, they're, they're t anyway, you, you cannot turn a human into a piece of paper. Anyway, writing a CV, I think, is one of the most excruciating things that you have to do. People make a living doing that for others. You know? I know, I know. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, looking back, I, I mean, you, you've been working for 20 years, you know, put that on a piece of paper. I think it's, it's just an impossible task. Exactly. Really. And so our, our, our starting point was CVs are garbage. Job descriptions are a total waste of time. Yeah. And so if that's your starting point... That's also a big problem, by the way. Yeah. People... I have a friend of mine, Eddie Malouf, when I said I'm interviewing, I'm interviewing you for this, he said, you know, you have... Like, the problem is on both ends. You have incompetent hiring managers trying to write uh, job descriptions or, or they just even don't even think about it. Uh, hard enough to write the right one. And on the other hand, sometimes you have young, inexperienced uh, recruiters trying to, for example, hire senior talent or uh, specialized talent, and they have no idea how to do it. Yeah, and, and to put another wrench into that, then you have the hiring manager, the person who's hiring for the world, tell you, man, I found a guy, he has a great personality, he doesn't have any of the requirements, it's okay, let's hire him. Yeah. And everything goes out the window anyway, yeah, yeah. right? And so... Our and first that's a bias, by the way, and that's not necessarily a good thing. No, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. It's yeah. absolutely terrible, yeah. right? <laughs> and so what we realized was like job descriptions are, are garbage, CVs are garbage, right? And then we realized that there's, there's so much bias in the process mm -hmm. that screws everything up. And for example, oh, Chris was a Kareem. He's the best marketeer. Yeah. Hired. I only did marketing when I got to Kareem. Yeah. Right. And I was uh, partly luck and partly problem solver, sure, but I'm not the best marketing talent out there. Right? That doesn't make me the most qualified. Right? And so, oh, you went to Karim or you were at Google or you were at Facebook. Yeah. Man, you're amazing. Yeah. But there's 7,000 people went through Karim. They can't all be great. Right? And so there's huge bias. And then there's bias of sex. And there's, then there's bias of nationality and culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. University. Exactly. And so all these biases are unwarranted. And hmm. so we said, okay, well, bias we need to get rid of. Yeah. And then w w we looked at another reality. And it was... Today, your ability to have opportunity as a job seeker and your ability to find talent is based on your ability to search. That has nothing to do with your capabilities, right? So if I'm, you know, super outspoken and an extrovert and I keep, you know, my network alive and I'm super vocal and everyone keeps thinking of Chris and I'm top of mind and I'm great, I'm going to have tons of opportunities presented to me. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not an extrovert, but I'm still brilliant, highly skilled, great experienced, great experience, Nobody's going to think of me. Nobody knows me. Yes. So my value on the market is is a perception. I know it's several not, people like that, by right? the way. One hundred percent. They are brilliant at what they do. They just they just don't network. Exactly. Right. And how is that fair? Mm. It's not. Mm. And then similarly, like you said, talent acquisition people, your ability to find talent is based on how good you can stalk people on LinkedIn mm. or network with people or be aware of, of specific things. But that's not your job. Your search is not your job specifically, right? And so we realized, okay, that needs to go. And so, you know, long story short, we went through the funnel. We said, oh, man, this whole thing's broken. Let's start from scratch. Um, and we're like, okay, let's look at similar industries that match people that are, you know, people find love online. Mm -hmm. they, they find their life partners online using dating sites. You know, so we're like, okay, th there's something there. Let's figure that out. And so we realized, okay. Let's get rid of job descriptions. Let's get rid of CVs. Let's find an objective way to measure uh, skills, human skills, um, and then find a way to kind of capture your values and, and, um, and personality. Because we also realized that tenure in companies is, is free-falling. You know, the average tenure in technology companies, even prior to COVID, was less than one year. Right? So if you think that people are leaving their jobs every year, typically it's not just because of the, you know, the job that they're in, but they're not aligned with the organization and its values. Mm -hmm. It's not matching their lifestyle. 
it's not what they want. And so the ability to capture that up front as well and match that against organizations is critical. So we said, okay, the hard matches will be um, uh, technical skills, human skills. Their softer matches will be values and personality. And then let's give people uh, a means to give different weights to what's important to them. Mm -hmm. So if values are really important to me, I'm going to put them really high in my matching criteria. If technical skills are really important to me as a recruiter for an engineering job, then put that really, really high. And so we took a model from the matchmaking world and tried to be very objective and unbiased in terms of recruitment and built our beta version of the product, which is live today. The idea was in our beta version to, to just learn, right? To like put it out there, see what happens. Um, you know, naively, I wanted to maybe get 50, 60 jobs on the platform, maybe a few thousand people and see if the basic algorithm and basic, you know, thinking hypothesis made sense. We launched it and it blew up. It, it, it just, and I think it blew up for two reasons in the sense that one, it I blew think, up, but by the like way, also to clarify positively, positively. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said you had crossed 6,000 6, matches, matches on the platform. Okay. Uh, and to me, that's amazing. I, and, I didn't, and, and when did you launch it? Uh, late February. Okay. Yeah. So. And so I thought, I thought, you know, my ambition was to take this year to learn and next year was going to be my scale period. And the idea was, let's see if this thing works. Let's optimize. Let's iterate. Let's fix whatever we think needs to be fixed. So we launched it and I think it, it was generally well received by recruiters because they agree. Job descriptions are terrible. There is no tool out there today that they love that they feel is solving anything. And they absolutely agreed that it's not a time saver. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was super well received on the recruiter side. And then job seeker wise, I mean, there's two things happening. People uh, in the job market is extremely unstable. So people do want, you know, another means to, to finding opportunity. And two is it's seamless. It takes you three minutes to create a profile and you do it once, you maintain yeah. it and you get matches. And I noticed something. It's, it's anonymous, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, it's not Lulu, who's, uh, you know, 41 years old, who's a female, who's whatever, no. living in Dubai. It's, it's anonymous. So it's anonymous. How, how are people receiving that? Because I, I, I think culturally, people would have a problem with that here. Absolutely. I think, I think it's, it's something we're learning. So basically, uh, it's go. anonymous up until the point that you like the, the person's skills and what they stand for, their values, etc. And then you decide to talk to them. And then obviously, it's like... Yeah. Uh, What's that? What's like that show reveal. called? The, the singing show, you know. You, oh, uh, <laughs> you click the button. Exactly, yeah. and then it's revealed. And then it's, it's like, exactly oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and, and so, what I love about it is that. And what happens? It's so funny. Like, so you know, you accept if you're looking for a job. Let's yeah. say you you're interested in a role. You get matched to it. You accept the role. Similarly, the recruiter accepts you. Then the match happens. Yeah, it's not revealed immediately. So what happens is you start to have a conversation after five exchanges. Everything is revealed. Okay. And so they know it's Lulu. If you have a profile picture, it'll be released as well. And they end up knowing who you are. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. I, I, I then can't, the biases can kick in. <laughs> yeah, but at least you know that you're biased and it's in your face. Okay. So you're consciously being, you know, making a decision <laughs> to acknowledge your bias and, and let that lead you. Okay. So if, if, if you're racist, you're still going to be racist. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to not make you a racist. I'm not going to have, I'm not going to get rid of your gender bias, yeah. but at least I'll put it in your face. Yeah. Because now you've matched, you loved her profile. You thought she was amazing. You accepted it. Yeah. Her technical skills were perfect. You matched perfect and you accepted her profile. Yeah. Then you found out her name was Lulu and then you got rid of her and you deleted her. Then I'm showing you your bias. Yeah. And I think that over time will educate people. I think more and more what will happen is the platform will show people that they have their biases, right? I don't think people are aware or conscious as much as they should be. And so I think the ambition is over time, people will see them and they'll start to say, you know what? I should consider Lulu or I should consider, you know, Muhammad or Christian or whoever, right? And so to me, that's, Hopefully the byproduct over time, yeah. right? It's it's complex. It's Super really complex. complex. I mean, I tried I tried this with Nabish uh, ten years ago, right? When I launched Nabish, and and honestly, it was be, ex like I had some really bad experiences with the recruitment on a personal level, and I thought, you know what, I this cannot be like the. I had issues with the middle people, right? With the recruiters, yep. uh, because obviously the recruiters are usually the gateway, and yeah. 
they would look at your paper, your CV, and uh, and that's it. Like within probably half a second or two, three seconds. I think the average is like two, three seconds. They look at uh, a CV and then and then you're out. And I just thought it's so unfair, you know, for so many people that may not have had the opportunity to study at Harvard or INSEAD or work at McKinsey or, you know, Kareem, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you. I mean, which is 99% of the population, you're you're screwed, like you, you don't yeah. get a chance. And and I think, yeah, there are, there are many circumstances that lead people to where they are. And uh, and it's just like, what, what I wanted to do with Nebesh is to show people's abilities and not shed light on only their experience. Um, yeah. But anyway, I discovered. So, so we're aligned. I discovered yeah. the hard way that it was yeah. uh, was a very difficult problem to solve. I think I think it's going to continue to be super difficult. I, Are I there I, surprises? Like oh yeah, 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 yeah. Tell, like can you share a few things yeah, yeah, that you I learned mean, and you were like surprised? Yeah, I mean, listen, the bias is there. I can with some certitude tell you that the data will show you that specific names are immediately discarded. Okay. You know, I can, I can, you know, once they're revealed, I can tell you like anybody who has a certain type of profile, typically conversations continue. And if they don't, then they don't. Right. I can, I can show you the biases to some extent, which is really a bit shocking, I think. Um, okay. But I think it's natural. And I think that that's something that, you know, will change over time. I think certain disciplines, this type of a solution and in certain industries, this will work much better with, um, and some, some industries less. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the, you know, j j just to give a more tangible example, we're doing very well in technical roles mm -hmm. and we're doing really well in, I would say, marketing and content roles, but we're not doing well in operations roles, finance roles, et cetera. Um, and I think that's, you know, biases within those industries as well. Right. Um, by the way, this is, this is a learning for me and, and like, I can share it with you. I think sure. it's focusing on one or a couple of industries is a, is, a, is a much, much better way of doing it. Absolutely. I went the other way with Nebbish. I went broad. We had yeah. like over 900 different skills on Nebbish. It was a big mistake. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree. And, yeah. and for us, the beta phase is for that. We okay. want to see where we're best suited and then scale. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think coming out of the beta phase, which is probably towards December, we're going to start to focus on one or two specific disciplines, because, like you said, like it's um, this platform only works with critical mass, and when you have enough of a focus in within a talent pool and a job pool, and so we have to do that by default. Um, so yeah, we've learned a lot, we've iterated a lot, we've we've I mean we've released I think fourteen versions of the product since we launched the beta, and so it's it's changed quite a bit. So, so I, I, I invited you because, you know, it's, I, I know that you're starting up and usually like I invite people who have built things and have been building them for a while, but I thought it's such an interesting, you know, problem that, uh, that you're tackling it. And I was just, again, curious to learn, you know, what you have uncovered so far. Yeah, I think, I think I, I'd say the following. I think I've never been this passionate about anything professionally. And I think, I think it's the it's the amalgamation of many things. One, I know nothing about this industry, and I'm learning every day. And to me, that's super exciting, right? I think I've it's been a few years since I feel like I've been intellectually stimulated as much. So I'm learning as much. So I think that's why I'm so excited. Number two, it's it's a burning problem, right? Unemployment is going through the roof, and yet everyone is saying that there's a lack of talent. I don't believe that there's a lack in talent. I think people just don't know how to search. I don't. I don't think people. The talent is there. People are just looking. I in the hear wrong that places. all the time. By I the hate way. that. I hate that yeah. statement. There is no lack in talent. You just don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to search, and so the talent is there. We just need to connect people. And third, I think if people ask me often, like, where does this go in the future? Mm. What's the vision of this? You know, I see a world where organizations don't scale by headcount anymore. I don't believe that you should build massive organizations. I don't think companies like Kareem, you know, where you have three, four, or 5,000 employees, I don't think that's success anymore. I actually think people should scale their, their organizations by, by kind of tasks. Um, and so you, I think keeping a headcount is something that you're going to have to keep as low as possible. And I think tools like Nobueno or others that will connect you to immediate talent as quickly as you can on an almost freelance kind of you know re relationship is the future of building organizations. I don't believe in full-time employees. I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in it from a lifestyle perspective for the employees. I don't believe it from an operations perspective for organizations. I believe the future is an open source world 
where anybody can do anything and work on anything that they want and where lifestyle is first and and so in order to do that you need these tools you need people to participate in these types of products and and, and networks so that you know, if I want to work three hours a day, I can, but my time is valued accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I believe in a future state where, where I'm not recruiting constantly. You know, like at Duck Life, I'm, I'm recruiting like crazy. Uh, we're growing, alhamdulillah, but it's not, it's not how, I don't, I don't, I don't love that. I don't think that's the right way to build organizations anymore. I have problems that I need to solve. I should be able to tap into any network to help me solve it yeah. and value the time accordingly. Um, and so that's what I believe No Bueno or products like No Bueno will do in the future state 10, 15 years down the road. And, you know, as, as the world moves to a remote fo- first organization, um, I think these tools are even more necessary mm. to be able to connect the talent all over the world, irrespective of your gender, irrespective of your culture, nationality, et cetera. And so being able to connect talent to opportunity is all I care about now. Um, and, you know, th- I think that everything is broken, and and I'm super naive going into it. I um I don't want to learn how other people are doing it. People ask me like, who do, did you compare yourself to LinkedIn? Did you compare yourself to this to that? I'm like, I'm aware of everybody, of course, but I don't want to pay attention to anybody. I want to try to problem solve it, and that means we will pivot a hundred times, we will adapt a hundred times. But to me, this is something that I have to spend at least the foreseeable future of my career solving, and hopefully it works. You yeah. Know? Um, Let's see. So, yeah. so j- to wrap for for all the frustrated folks who who have been through bad experiences on on either side of the aisle, right? Whether they were applicants or hiring managers, because it's equally challenging, you know, when you are trying to hire. Yeah. Do you have like quick tips, you know, two to three tips uh, for each, based on what you've learned so far and what you've uh, uncovered uh, through No Bueno? Yeah. So, so absolutely, I think for applicants. Yeah, absolutely. I think. When it comes to applicants, I think be as honest as you can mm-hmm. um, in terms of who you are and what you can or cannot do. And, you know, try to align yourself to organizations that kind of respond to you on a, on, on a value system first. And the best way to find opportunity is to learn more about the organization and the people within the organization. I don't believe in a world of applications. I don't, I don't believe in that anymore. Every opportunity that, that I've ever kind of successfully filled in my organization or my teams um, has always been uh, based on having an opportunity to understand the people on the other side of the table. And that doesn't happen through an application process. That happens through networking. That happens through recommendations. That happens through being vocal about specific things. So, you know, keeping your LinkedIn page up to date does not mean changing, you know, your dates and which month you were there and sharing articles of your industry, but also sharing your opinion, participating in conversations. And if there's organizations that you absolutely love and you want to be a part of, connect with that organization Mm -hmm. and make that your sole focus, not just one click apply to 52 jobs in four hours. Yeah. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Is that? And if you're an introvert? And if you're an introvert, then you have to work on your personality, unfortunately. And hopefully products like No Bueno will make up for that over time. Right. Um, you know, I, I really feel bad because I'm extremely extroverted. I have supreme confidence. I am so lucky and privileged. Right. And so I'm, you know, lucky to be aware of opportunities all yeah. the time. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, people who are introverted need to understand the value of being able to communicate, need to understand the value of being able to kind of express yourself. It is critical to your success. It is critical to your life. Communication skills are everything. And so if you feel that you are really bad at communication skills, that's your step one. Um, and and hopefully we'll catch up, and hopefully technology will play a better role than it has in the past. Mm-hmm. And people who struggle with this, hopefully technology will solve that, and, and I really hope so. But even once once that's fixed, communication skills are the sole, um, you know, biggest contributor to your success in your life, personally or professionally. Okay. Your ability to communicate is everything, and so um, you know, I, I I highly recommend to introverts to really work on that. Okay. And in the meantime, I'll do my best to support. And on the on the uh, jo- on the hiring manager side, what what's your tip? Don't be biased. Don't be biased. Don't be biased, and on every level, on professional skills, skills you can teach, you can teach anyone anything. Character and personality, you cannot. And so, you know, I see roles that are open for four, five, six months at a time, and they just can't find anybody. That's impossible. They're just missing out on opportunities to build talent. Talent and recruitment is about attracting, retaining, and developing talent. The problem, there's an interesting st- statistic. I don't remember what it is. I'll try to find it. Maybe you can put a link in the podcast. But about 20 years ago, 
um, most new roles were typically filled, 70% or more were filled by uh, in-house teams. So mm -hmm. people were, were promoted uh, most of the time, 20 years ago. Today, it's less than 5%. We always look for talent externally. When organizations scale, they always think about looking elsewhere first. And sure, they posted on internal boards. Sure, they, they shared internally, but they don't consider people as much as they used to because they don't have the skill sets. And back in the day, organizations would invest heavily in developing talent. But then when technology came around, we assumed that nobody knows technology except the new young kids. But now all these young kids, we all know technology to some extent the same way. Mm -hmm. And rather than looking externally all the time, invest in your freaking people, right? Like the talent is there. Right? And I've been victim to that too. I've seen how an organization might not think that I'm able to move higher than where I am today, but it's completely untrue. Interesting. You know, if the character and the personality is there and a person has been successful in a specific job, they will in the next. And do so you, believing in that, I think, is, is critical. Do you feel that that's, a, that's like more of a, um, an entry level or, or like a mid level issue? Because actually, my, my experience is different. Uh, I find it harder as someone who's a, who's senior to join a company because I feel that there's always preference to people internally. Like really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I but mean, maybe it's a certain type of companies. I mean, I'm talking uh, multinationals, and yeah, m maybe maybe it's a different type of company. But I, but I feel that yes, but, that's the case. But to that point, that's where the bias is the issue, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than the the, the 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 mentality to upskilling, right? And so. You know, a lot of organizations, especially like FMCGs, big brands, et cetera, like that, they, they have specific criteria like uh, like Harvard or this type yeah. of brand, et cetera. Yeah. And so they have specific biases that over overshadow all the other stuff. Yeah. And then that plays a bigger weight than everything else. Probably, actually. Probably. Could be. And, and, and for them, it's, it's, it's typically a problem-solving solution. They get thousands and thousands and thousands of applicants. For, yeah. So for them, the bias is warranted in the sense that it's a time saver for them. Mm -hmm. And so for them, it's a filtration process that makes their life easy. But it omits the reality of the talent that they might have in house. Yeah. Right. And so it's just a simplification of their role. It's it's a it's a certain laziness to the role rather than an actual solution that is, let's say, sustainable for organizations. Yeah. And so yeah, I think I think if when I speak to recruiters and 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 I speak to them all the time now. Yeah. The first thing I tell them is, you know, I'm sure the talent is either in your existing team or you've already spoken to them. You just didn't consider them. And, and and I think that's true nine out of ten times. Well, I think I think it's uh, I don't think it has been cracked. I I, I I'm I'm gonna be watching closely what you do at No Bueno. I think the referral piece and getting to know the company is is definitely something yeah. uh, that hasn't been that hasn't been maybe tapped into uh, as much as much as uh, we should. Um, but I think yeah, I think maybe the. The solution would lie would lie there. Yeah, um, I, I think so. And 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 who knows? I think we're going to continue learning and yeah. we'll evolve. And yeah. uh, hopefully, it works out. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you for having for me. all your insights. It was great thank to you. have you. And thank you to everyone who sent me questions and comments and and shared experiences uh, ahead of this episode. So that thank you. They gave me some insights so I can uh, have this conversation with you. Thank Thanks you for coming. Me. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in to this conversation with Chris Saeed. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to know about know more about Chris, you can visit weareducklife.com or nobueno.com. Don't forget to visit the show's website, conversationswithlulu.com, to check out all the other episodes. You can also reach out to me on social media at Lulu Hazan. Don't forget to give us a rating and a review if you're if you're enjoying the show. It would really help us in getting the show discovered. And don't forget to subscribe to get the latest episodes. I wish you lots of love and light and see you in a few weeks. <laughs>